Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Moore. I'm the CEO of the Virginia Funders Network. Welcome to the kickoff of our Housing Funders Networking Group. Today, we're going to be digging into the looming eviction crisis, um, and we are so excited to be kicking off this new group. We have um, over 30 folks that are registered to attend today's session. Before I turn it over to our uh, networking group co-chair, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on VFN uh, and where we are to date. Um, we are um, rounding into our one year anniversary as an organization. I joined in February and uh, have just celebrated six months on the job. Um, Patty Koval and I have been working behind the scenes um, to really get the organization up and running. We're, we're bucketing our work right now um, into to three main categories. The first is really building a solid foundation for the organization. As anyone has, who has ever worked in a startup knows, um, there's a lot of, of basics that we need as an organization. Um, we're hopefully gonna have a, a, a brand new website that'll launch next month. We have our new logo, as you can see here on the screen. Um, we have bylaws, a budget, um, all the basics that we uh, that we need to have a really solid foundation for the organization. The second bucket is around uh, is really building a vibrant network. So right now we have almost 100 member organizations, funders across the Commonwealth who have invested in VFN and joined as members, um, and we are looking to not only grow that membership but also build community among the Commonwealth's. Um, uh, funding community. So we've launched um, four networking groups so far. Um, we're launching that's the, today's housing uh, funders networking group. We have a community foundation networking group, an education funders networking group, and a social justice funders networking group, and a health funders networking group is going to launch later this fall. Um, and so we are, we're really excited about these opportunities to bring you together virtually and also really looking forward to when we can be back in person, hopefully at an annual conference this spring. Stay tuned for more on that. And then the third bucket is really leverage and leadership. Now that we've got the philanthropic community across the state pulled together, what can we do together to really improve quality of life for all Virginians? Um, and we're really excited. We think this is the biggest uh, area of potential for VFN now that we've got the, the power of the network behind us. Um, so stay tuned um, for more information about this bucket. This is really going to be our advocacy, um, our, our voice of philanthropy in the Commonwealth. Uh, and we think that we've got really great potential to work together. So um, that's a little bit about where we are at VFN. You'll be hearing more um, from us this fall uh, with updates on where we are. Um, but now I want to turn it over to our networking group co-chairs. Please help me welcome Caroline Nowry um, Virginia, of Virginia Community Capital and Susan Hallett um, of the Bob and Anna Lou Shaberg Foundation. Um, these ladies have agreed to, to lead this work um, for this year, and they are both very well suited to it. Um, Caroline, not only is she with BCC, but she's also the board chair of the Virginia Impact Investing Forum, um, and she's on the advisory committee for Housing Families uh, for, for Housing Families First, which she also um, previously chaired for a number of years. And uh, Susan um, not only is with the Shaberg Foundation, but she spent 16 years at the Greater um, uh, the Community Foundation for Greater Richmond. Um, and it's really working a lot in addition to uh, some other areas in housing work with the Shaberg Foundation, and we're excited to have their uh, expertise. Ladies, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Katie. Um, and I'm excited to be here and to see all the participants who are interested in, in this work. Um, I wanted to give a brief um, sort of overview of the purpose of this um, group and it's really to educate and engage VFN members around the current housing landscape and the continuum of housing related issues, including homelessness, access to affordable housing and housing development. Um, and what we hope to accomplish and the goals we have are to recruit and maintain an active core group of at least eight member organizations to plan and execute at least three programs events for this year that will attract participation by at least 10 member organizations and to provide a venue for members to exchange resources, innovative strategies, and opportunities for partnership. Um, excited about today's speakers. We have um, presenters including a housing policy advocate, a philanthropic partner, and a nonprofit developer who will share their thoughts around the affordable housing landscape across the state, the eviction moratorium, discuss gaps that philanthropy can fill, um, and resident needs and feeling as moratorium is ending as well as current housing initiatives. Um, I'd like now to turn it over to Susan Hallett to provide an overview of the current looming crisis related to evictions and introduce the speakers. 
Yes, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. And we're really pleased that you could join us for this incredibly timely discussion um, about the looming um, housing crisis in Virginia. We have been talking about the term eviction moratorium. And just to provide some context, the idea behind the eviction moratorium is that it prevents landlords from removing people from their homes for the non-payment of rent. There's been an eviction moratorium in place in a variety of different forms since March of 2020. Moratoria have been enacted at both the state and federal levels. And in addition, the federal government has put over $2 trillion into COVID relief, which includes a large portion of rental assistance. Uh, and the Virginia rent relief program alone has paid out more than $311 million to over 48,000 households since its inception in July of 2020. But at the same time, according to the US Census survey responses, Virginia renters are experiencing growing levels of housing instability and eviction pressures across the state with 62% of households who are not caught up on rent fearing eviction in the next two months. And in the first and second quarters of 2021, 1,403 eviction cases were filed with pending hearing dates of July 15th or later. Such eviction cases increased by over 204% from the first to the second quarter. And this data comes from the RVA Eviction Lab, which is a tremendous resource um, in our community for across the data across the Commonwealth. So as Caroline said today, we're really fortunate to have with us some uh, experts in the field who are gonna help us understand the complexities of the current affordable housing landscape and share some innovative solutions to meet the needs of communities across the Commonwealth. Our speakers today are Greta Harris, President and CEO of Better Housing Coalition, Brian Koziel, Executive Director of Virginia Housing Alliance, and Jessica Wergo, CEO of the Community Foundation of the New River Valley. Our speakers are gonna share a presentation with you for about 12 minutes, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions while our speakers are talking, please put them in the chat. Um, if you would like to share your question verbally, that's fine too. Our speakers will take a pause at the end of their presentation and allow for Q&A at that time. Uh, we are going to kick off our presentation today with Brian. So Brian, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I've got a couple of slides. I think I'm going to share my screen. All right, um, so just really wanted to, um, you know, run through really quickly about the Virginia Housing Alliance. So we are a membership organization. Um, we have over um, 130 members from across the state, um, all um, having to do with the affordable housing continuum, all the way from uh, tax credit investors and syndicators to nonprofit developers and housing providers and homelessness service um, providers as well. And so um, our mission is to expand um, affordable housing opportunities and end homelessness through advocacy, education, and capacity building. And we do this, you know, through a, a bunch of different things, um, notably two large conferences, um, our housing credit conference. I'm actually, I just sent out about 30 emails last night to sponsors. We are uh, unfortunately moving from uh, in-person to virtual. Um, and then our housing Virginia's most vulnerable. So kind of hitting at um, both kind of ends of the spectrum, the, the tax credit investors, and then those that are doing the, the frontline work and service delivery. Um, capacity building, we um, operate the uh, VHA AmeriCorps VISTA program. So we work with 14 um, host sites and place AmeriCorps VISTA members with them for a year of service. Um, throughout the throughout the state to build the capacity and we've had really great outcomes with that uh, about um, eight uh, 
roughly eight members get hired on by their host site at the end of their service term. Um, another three or four end up staying within uh, Virginia and within the housing sector. Um, and so we um, are, are incredibly proud about that program. The other, the other piece we do is, is advocacy um, and, and policy work both at the General Assembly as well as um, up in Capitol Hill and you know the federal advocacy we have done more and more of over the last you know 18 months as housing has and the need for affordable housing has really kind of come to the the forefront of our collective conversation due to due to the um, pandemic. You know, and I kind of want to um, you know talk about this this really briefly this concept of this looming crisis, right? Like there, we we have have been in a housing crisis for a very long time. Um, we don't have enough units. Uh, incomes have not kept pace with costs um, and kind of that ladder of opportunity um, has been whittled away. And I think a lot of that has you know, really come to the forefront um, over, the, over the past year as we kind of look at and, and better understand the interconnectedness of housing and, and stable housing and Health Hello. outcomes, educational Hello. outcomes. Hello. Okay. I'm in a, I'm in a Zoom. Um, and so I did want to just kind of go over and, and give kind of the history of the eviction moratoriums. Um, they have been both state and federal um, and have kind of come and gone as the case may be. So the the first one was um, March 16th, 2020. Um, the Virginia Supreme Court placed a temporary hold on evictions um, in Virginia through May 18, 2020. Then on the 27th of March, Congress uh, passed the first Federal Relief um, Act, the, the CARES Act. So, you know, $2.2 trillion in aid. And that also included an eviction moratorium. Um, that ran initially from March 27th through July 24th. Um, and that was, it was pretty narrowly targeted to um, public housing and HUD finance multifamily properties. Um, during that time, a, a number of our nonprofit partners also implemented their own eviction moratoriums. Um, you know, and that's kind of the, the, the benefit of, of working with, with mission-minded um, partners is that we are, you know, they are always trying to do the right thing um, and, you know, certainly recognize the need to keep people stably housed during, during this crisis. So fast forward to September 4th, 2020, um, the CDC imposed the nationwide federal moratorium on, on residential evictions that has been that was extended um, through January 31st and then extended again through March 31st, 2021. Uh, right before it was set to expire on March 29th, um, the Biden administration extended it through June and then they extended it again until July 31st. And then uh, just a couple of weeks ago on August 3rd, the CDC issued a, another eviction moratorium um, and the way they kind of worked around <clears throat> some of the, the <clears throat> legal issues, I, I believe is it was in um, effective in areas um, of uh, substantive and high trans transmission or rates. Um, and I believe these slides will be available, but you can click on this and, and look at your local jurisdictions to see um, where they fall in that. But I believe um, nearly all of Virginia is um, in, a, in a substantial and high transmission rate as of, as of today. Um, and then the General Assembly passed um, the budget bill um, on, and Governor Northam signed it on August 10th. 
which includes um, eviction protections in Virginia through June 30th, 2022. These are um, specific to non-payment of rent. Um, and so, you know, ten, our landlords can still evict um, tenants um, for, you know, for, for lease violations, just not for, for payment of rent, unless they go through um, a process um, that includes providing tenants information about the Virginia Rent Relief Program. Uh, they apply for rental assistance on behalf of the tenant, and then they wait for 45 days for the rental assistance application to get approved. Um, and so after that point, if um, the rental assistance application is not approved or if um, the, the tenant refuses to comply or provide information that's um, necessary for um, the application, they can um, be evicted. But what we're finding is that that is generally a very small, very small percentage of, of folks. Um, and I'll just give a give an overview of the rental assistance program. So June 29th, 2020, um, the state stood up one of the first uh, operational rent relief programs in the nation. It was, um, and it's gone through a couple of iterations. They've been really um, good at working with their partners and stakeholders to constantly tweak and improve um, how the program works. And it's really, you know, the overarching goal is to pre prevent the spread of COVID um, by keeping, keeping people safely housed. Um, there are two pots of funding for this one come um, was through the emergency rental assistance funds under the CARES Act um, of 524 million in the second round ERA two is from the American Rescue Plan Act and that's an, an additional 451 million dollars so we've got roughly a billion dollars to to get in the hands of landlords um, to keep tenants that have been impacted by um, the economic downturn and, and COVID um, safely housed. And so just looking at um, kind of the, some numbers, as of July, 48,000 households had, had received um, rental assistance. The total amount um, dispersed was $311 million, almost $312 million. The average, uh, you know, amount dispersed to uh, per household is about 6,000. If you look at, I think, the some of these other numbers here, 79% of all households are at or below 30% of area median income. So the, the program is effectively reaching um, those that it, that it needs to. 67% of households have um, a ch a, you know, children under eight, 52% are black, 23% are white. Um, they have re recently just put a, um, sig a, a significant grant out um, to, to do targeted outreach um, and really work with um, community partners to help to assist people with applying and to do outreach to traditionally um, underserved communities to, to try and get this money out there. I mean, it is literally free money um, and it, it needs to get, you know, we need, we need to spend this. It's, it's critically important um, to get this, this money into the hands of the folks that need it. Um, and so, you know, this is all, all great, right. Um, in, in, it is absolutely the, the correct thing to do. When I think about the scale of this program, um, it's kind of mind blowing, right? Like there has never been uh, interaction or kind of any infrastructure between the state and landlords and certainly not the state and tenants, not on this scale. And so, yes, the program um, took some time to get up to speed. 
um, but it is now being hailed as one of the one of the best programs um, in the nation. I was actually watching a uh, White House press conference and uh, Jennifer Saki mentioned, you know, called out Virginia from the podium as being being one of the two leaders in in the country in, in dispersing these funds. So kudos to everyone that has has worked on that. So, but you know, so rent relief and rental assistance is certainly one one piece of the puzzle, but it's not getting to the heart of what the issue is in Virginia and across the country. And that's really just a, a, a lack of affordable housing um, being built. And certainly, um, I, I mean, I advocate at the General Assembly and, and at in Capitol Hill for, for more funding. And so on one hand, I, you know, I'd like to think that we can build our way out of this, but, but we can't. Um, we need a multifaceted approach of which rental assistance is a piece of that, but we also um, need to, you know, reform our, our tax code. We need to increase wages um, and, and be able to pay people um, to live. And so this is just kind of material um, from a, a quick uh, housing quick fact guide that we put together for, for legislators. And so in Virginia, you know, to afford a, a, the average uh, one bedroom apartment, you need to earn $20 and 24 cents an hour. Um, and at minimum wage, you're looking at, I believe 88 um, hours per week, you need to work to be able to afford that average um, unit. Um, on any given night, we have 6,000 people experiencing homelessness across the Commonwealth. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> there, are a lot of, there are a lot of reasons that people experience homelessness. The single most, um, the, or the single largest one is we don't have enough affordable housing, right? There are, you know, certainly people are struggling with um, addiction or victims of domestic violence, all of, these, all of these things that are destabilizing. But at the end of the day, the number one cause of, of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. And so, you know, all of, this, all of these things disproportionately impact um, Black, Hispanic, you know, non-white Virginians um, significantly. And so at you know, the Housing Alliance, our, our mission is to increase access to affordable housing, um, home ownership, and, and decrease these racial disparities that are kind of foundational to, um, you know, honestly, what, what uh, this country was, was built upon. So I don't know how I'm doing on time, you're doing you're okay. You're close to the <laughs> close to the 12 minute mark, but go yeah. ahead, Brian. Okay. No. So, um, I, you know, I'm happy to wrap it up there. I don't, I don't have another slide. That was it. Um, so I am more than happy to, um, answer any questions as, as I'm able to. While folks are thinking about their questions, Brian, can I ask if they're, um, are there some unintended consequences with the eviction moratorium? I'm wondering if we are essentially kicking the can down down the road a bit, um, and and what you're thinking is about about that, and that that we haven't really seen the turnover that we typically see in rental housing, which has maybe created a larger issue for our homeless services partners. Yeah, I, you know. I, I, to a degree, perhaps. I know that Virginia's unemployment rate is really low. I know that um, there are many different ways to look at that, the, 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 the numbers that are used to calculate that rate. Um, I did see a presentation from my, my friends over at the Virginia Apartment Management Association um, that, you know, polling their members, um, which are which is relatively diverse. It, there's, um, you know, I think they have a couple nonprofit members, um, but their their monthly rental collections 
are not far off from what they have historically been, right? So I think, um, and, and certainly as you go, you know, you have property uh, class A, B, C. Um, as you go down to lower income properties, I think that that delinquency rate certainly goes up. Um, and so, yes, I mean, we are, in, in, you know, in one sense, just kind of uh, prolonging this, but in the interim, we are providing um, stability for families and individuals, um, you know, and there's hopefully if, you know, we ever are able to ever kind of come out of, of COVID. And I was talking to Greta yesterday and she said, you know, something about 2024, um, you know, that we are able to, to intervene in a way such as to, to mitigate some of the, some of the, the tsunami, right? Thank you. Other one go ahead, one quick question for Brian. Uh, to the degree that you can tell us, uh, how does Northern Virginia skew the numbers for the rest of Virginia? And does the rest of Virginia sit largely in the same box or are we segmented as well? So, you know, that's one of the challenges of running a, a statewide organization. Um, and certainly my, my good friend and, and colleague, Michelle Crocker um, with, the, um, with Navaja I, is on the call. Um, and yeah, I mean, Virginia, or Northern Virginia certainly skews, when we're looking at statewide numbers, they certainly kind of skew those. Um, but I will say that uh, Virginia is segmented, right? And you've kind of got that, that urban crescent. Um, Northern Virginia is way more expensive than, than the Richmond region. Um, and, but, you know, Richmond is relatively comparable to Hampton Roads. And then you've kind of got Southside and Southwest Virginia. Um, what I've come to kind of the conclusion of is that all of these regions face the exact same issues. They just present themselves a little bit differently. Um, rural Virginia is more spatially, the you know, dispersed, and so it's um, you know, it, development is is a different is a different process. Services um, providing services or take a different take a different model. Um, and then they don't have the, you know, the density challenges and, and high cost development challenges in Northern Virginia, but certainly it is segmented, but yes, when you're looking at kind of statewide data, and I'm happy to provide you with um, whatever regional data on, um, you know, the number of hours needed to work per week to afford, um, you know, the average unit based on your geographic region. Thanks, Brian. Um, in order to make sure we've got time for our, our other speakers, we're going to move on. But if you have additional questions for Brian, pop them in the chat or hold on to them. And if we have a chance, we can circle back. Um, our next speaker is Jessica Wargo. Jessica, again, is um, with the Community Foundation in um, the New River Valley. Um, and Jessica, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Great. Well, thanks so much, Susan, and, and thanks everyone for having me. So we were just talking about kind of regional differences in housing. And so um, our foundation's based in Southwest Virginia. So I'm going to share my screen and tell you a little bit about <clears throat> the housing challenges that are unique to our region and how our foundation um, is addressing those needs. Um, everybody see my screen okay? Good. Okay. Um, so for those who may not be familiar with the New River Valley, so we are um, kind of southwest of Roanoke, uh, excuse me, and we include um, four counties in the city of Radford. So within our region, we have um, Montgomery County and particularly Virginia Tech as um, a major employer and of course major driver of things that are happening across our region, um, making for a much more dense population within Montgomery County. 
But then um, we're also home to Floyd County, which has a lot of agricultural land, um, as well as Giles County, which is largely um, Jefferson National Forest and really boasts a lot of natural resources and recreation. So we have a pretty interesting landscape where we have very rural areas, um, as well as more densely packed areas, and the housing issues can be unique from town to town, um, but we also see some trends across our region as a whole. And you can just kind of see I provided some demographics to give you a sense that um, we certainly deal particularly from our rural regions with a lot of poverty um, and have to figure out how we provide affordable housing particularly housing that um, uh, allows folks to also um, not have to travel too far for work, which I'll talk about in a moment. So our region just went through um, a housing study with our local regional commission and um, the Virginia Center for Housing Research and found a lot of things um, that were certainly um, existing prior to COVID and I think um, were just exacerbated with COVID. So um, like Brian already talked about, we have a real lack of safe and accessible housing for our low income population. Um, about a quarter of households are considered cost burdened, so spending more than that 30% on housing and that rate just goes up for our renter households. Um, our rental vacancy rate's quite low here, and a lot of the pricing is driven by the fact that we have a large student rental population in both Montgomery County and Radford, and even in some of our areas outside of that. And so the demand um, for sort of higher end rentals is here with our student population, but also for more affordable non-student folks as well. And part of the issue that we see as well in the rental market um, is because it's so easy to find renters, um, issues with long-term maintenance of properties uh, is an issue. So folks are just not living in the safest environments, even if they can remain in their rental housing. Um, another couple issues that we're really seeing here are an aging housing stock. So particularly in our more rural areas, we have older housing. And that's just adding to cost for folks. So these are homes that often may not be well maintained. They're certainly not weatherized um, in a way that would keep utility costs down. And then we're seeing that um, this is just not the kind of housing that's appropriate for an aging population. So there are parts of the New River Valley where within the next 10 years, we'll have one in three people, say in Giles County, that's gonna be over 65 years old. Um, so a lot of the housing that's available is just not appropriate if you've got mobility challenges. And of course, for our lower income older adults, they're having challenges with maintaining those homes as well. Um, and so an issue here is as much about new, new affordable housing stock as it is about critical home repairs for our existing housing. And then finally, as I mentioned, public transportation for our rural areas is a real issue. So our employment base is certainly in the more densely populated areas like Montgomery County. Um, but because folks can afford housing in the more rural areas, they, the trade-off there is having to travel. And so many folks are traveling quite a bit for work. So as we think in the region about housing costs, we include within that um, utilities, as well as transportation, because they're really um, adding significantly to the burden for um, both homeowners and renters. So um, more specifically around COVID here in our region, our local community action took the lead on um, dispersing funds specifically related to um, rent and mortgage assistance. And, um, in speaking with them last week, we got a little bit of interesting information around what we might expect to go forward. So certainly a high demand for that CARES Act funding between June and November of last year to support households being able to remain in their homes. But overall, what they saw when they were looking more broadly at some of their um, pre-existing emergency assistance funds, so not specifically CARES related, was a decline um, in the number of families coming to them in 2020 and 2021. And they're really thinking that this is because folks were getting that enhanced unemployment support as well as stimulus payment. And so they weren't necessarily needing to access those services. But importantly, the families that were coming to community action needed more financial assistance. So just larger amounts that they were required in order to stay afloat. So the concern for the folks at that agency is that when that stimulus money 
um, when the eviction moratorium ends that folks are going to be coming back and needing more substantial support and it's hard to figure out how exactly we navigate that. Um, the one thing that I've been hearing as a funder kind of loud and clear from all the agencies we work with is trying to figure out how we navigate um, eligibility requirements, limits on the duration of funding, and sort of differing definitions depending on program of what um, constitutes being homeless. And so having to navigate those is difficult enough for um, our caseworkers that are helping, but certainly for the clients as well. And I think it creates some barriers and, and um, really challenges in working with clients and developing those relationships to provide long-term support um, that are gonna make it difficult, certainly during COVID, but even uh, prior to COVID and now after we get past COVID, trying to figure out how we simplify what's an incredibly complex landscape. So um, kind of what can we do as a funder? So I should say first off that the Community Foundation, we are tiny. Um, we are just under $15 million in assets, so we're quite small, and we have three staff members. So the name of the game for us has always been a lot of partnership and collaboration and figuring out how we leverage not just our financial resources, um, but also our relationships and our reach and so we've been, as a funder, kind of looking at this issue in a few different ways. Um, so when it comes to kind of addressing the immediate needs that we see in housing, first and foremost, we really focus on flexible funding. So trying to make sure that if our nonprofits that are doing this work are having to follow strict eligibility requirements with that state and federal money, that our money gives them maximum flexibility. So in the last two years, we have only awarded kind of unrestricted operating support for organizations to put the money where it's most needed. And we've heard that that's been um, incredibly helpful to fill gaps and be able to provide additional support for families when it runs out through other programs. We've also looked at ways to leverage our grant management capacity so while this was prior to COVID, I think it's instructive. We um, partnered with local government as well as the Funders Network to bring a critical home repair program to our region where, where we were offering um, adults 55 and up money to both weatherize their homes and do some critical repairs that would allow them to stay in the home. And while our own financial um, output for this was limited, what we could do is provide um, some assurance to the funders network that we knew how to manage money here. We know how to report on receiving grants and we're a strong partner that can accept those resources. So we're looking to continue to do that. And then we do a lot of work here on disseminating information. So there are some great nonprofits that um, do wonderful work in the area, but they don't always know about one another. So we try to create a lot of opportunities for them to meet one another whether it's face-to-face -face or through Zoom and um, make that referral process and collaboration as easy as possible. So that might be workshops we've done specifically on housing. We had a session just earlier this morning with nonprofits on the new Unite Us platform that's coming to our region and working regularly with nonprofits in that connection. And then, um, Kind of longer term, as, as we've talked about already, you know, these issues are just exacerbated during COVID, but are, are, have been critical in our region for a while. Um, so we've tried to figure out other ways that we can look at housing long term as we grow our own funding base. Um, so we've tried to be a partner in some redevelopment projects in our area, most notably the redevelopment of an elementary school. Um, by a private developer into a mixed use um, housing, uh, as well as retail environment. And we were able to help pull some partners together, um, assist with writing grants. And we also do some impact investing um, in partnership with Virginia Community Capital. And so we tried to bring all of that to bear on this project where we didn't have a lot of funding to put in, but we could put our the time and energy of our staff and our connections we also try with everything we do to take some time to reflect and um, report on what we're doing. So we created a publication from that work we did with the Funders Network on critical home repair that we've shared with our local elected officials as well as the HDA on what we saw as the um, opportunities for 
funding focused more on home repair as well as some of the barriers to that with our population. Um, and then finally, we do a lot of cross-sector events here in the NRV um, with local governments. We're very closely aligned with our regional commission. And so we create opportunities where we can help support collaboration or show best practices that we're seeing um, and try to help support folks to be able to adopt those within their individual communities. So a lot of it as a funder isn't just about the funding, it's about those additional um, resources that we have through our connections and our people that really make for um, an impact even when you're a smaller foundation like us. Um, and I just wanted to show you for those who may be interested, um, the Prices Ford Redevelopment Project is one that I know the Appalachian Regional Commission talks a lot about as a model. Um, so it's a fabulous kind of 1950s um, elementary school that the community really wanted to see remain and not be demolished. And so a private developer came in and it's now, uh, they've changed the classrooms into um, these apartments that are both income-based as well as market rate. They've added some additional apartments in a new building and have put in a community kitchen and brewery. Um, and they really leveraged funding as well as kind of local partnerships to make this happen. And it's the kind of thing that we really try to encourage and talk with folks about in our region as um, a model to be able to be true to kind of what our region is, is known for um, and to be able to um, keep some of these gems like this wonderful school, but also use it to meet current needs. So I think with that, I'll stop sharing and happy to answer any questions that folks have. Any questions for Jessica? If you think of any <laughs> um, as we move along, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and we can circle back with Jessica. Um, thank you so much, Jessica. That was a great presentation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Greta Harris, who's president and CEO of Better Housing Coalition. Greta, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will just make a statement uh, to Jessica that uh, would love to explore more with you. I'm on the board at Virginia Tech and um, we're now starting to talk about our role um, in helping to produce more affordable housing in the region. So um, we want to be a good partner in, in those ongoing efforts. Um, thanks for the invitation to be with you all today. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Better Housing Coalition. We're a 30 plus year old nonprofit housing developer, um, manager and owner. Uh, we currently have a little over 1600 rental units in about 18 different communities in central Virginia. Have nearly 3000 people who live in our community. Um, we also do affordable for sale housing to increase wealth building um, for families who purchase homes. And we um, also have done community services uh, development, um, i.e. a health clinic, a daycare center, community centers, and um, unique among real estate development entities, we also provide services to help our families to thrive. Um, if they are living in one of our communities. We um, have a $22 million a year budget. I have almost 70 employees and our business model is that we self-generate nearly 90% of our budget on an annual basis. Um, and the way we do that is that about 80% of that revenue comes from our portfolio um, rental income. And so having um, a moral obligation to provide quality, safe housing for families in exchange for them agreeing to pay rent is the way our model works. The other 10 or 12% of revenue comes from developer fees for new development. So the last year and a half or so has been challenging for anyone who is a landlord. 
Um, and at a macro level, we operate within a housing financing ecosystem. And what that means is that we have renters who are looking for housing. And once they find housing, they agree uh, to honor the agreement to pay X amount of dollars for rent. As a landlord, we lease the apartments and we collect the rent. And we in turn take some of that rent, pay our operating expenses and the bulk of it goes to pay um, our mortgage holder um, for the debt that we have on the property. Um, and in our case, most of our mortgages, about $26 million worth of mortgages are held by Virginia Housing, the State Housing Finance Agency. Um, and we are one of many for-profit and nonprofit uh, landlords that get our financing from Virginia Housing. They in turn take um, are able to offer hundreds of millions of dollars of mortgages because they issue bonds to the broader marketplace. So up on Wall Street, investors are looking for places to park their money. And when everyone stands behind their obligation in this ecosystem, it works really, really well. Um, but when a global pandemic happens, the whole ecosystem has now been disrupted. And as just a little example, because we're a relatively small player in this ecosystem here in Virginia, um, when the pandemic really hit hard last spring, we were notified that over um, 300 households had lost jobs because a lot of our renters are um, lower wage workers. They were in the hospitality industry, they were in the restaurant industry, um, they did uh, the gig economy, um, Uber drivers, et cetera. Uh, they were cafeteria workers. And when everything shut down, people lost their jobs. And the numbers for us equates to almost a quarter of a million dollars of revenue loss per month. And for any business, that is a lot of money that just isn't coming into our, our system because we still had payroll to make, we still had mortgage debt that we had to, to pay. Um, and so it was a little scary. Luckily, we operate in Central Virginia and we have a very generous and, and, and uh, just passionate uh, philanthropic sector here. And we were able to quickly raise nearly a million dollars for our own private sector rental assistance and services support for families that were impacted by the pandemic. And what that did, it gave us a one way of two to three months of money. Um, while CARES Act money and now the ARPA monies were being put in place into a rental assistance system. Um, what I would say is that the current circumstances and with the eviction moratorium hanging out there and we keep kicking the can down the road and down the road, but eventually there's gonna be a price to be paid. Um, the current system is dangerous um, and it's not sustainable. Um, we can't just keep doing this. At some point or another, we have to get people, help people get back on their feet and have the ecosystem start to work again. Um, some of those critical action steps that you know, each of us has to do our own part, but there's, there's more work that needs to be done globally is we have to control the spread of the virus. Um, I mean, that's just critical. We can't um, have a, a, a bustling or a recovery for our economy, which is critical in getting people working again, and hopefully at living wage employment options, um, unless we, we, we can control the virus a little bit better. And it's become so political right now, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that is done. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, we can't build our way out of this uh, decades long um, lag of affordable housing inventory across the country. Um, housing is expensive and it takes a long time to do. Um, from the onset of when we have an idea for a new rental development, if everything, and I do mean everything went well, it's three years before we can be with our elected officials and investors to cut the ribbon. 
And more times than not, it's about a four year lag. And if you're doing permanent supportive housing, that timeline almost goes to five or six years. So it, it, it is important for us to um, refurbish and grow the affordable housing inventory, but as Brian said, that is not the only solution. Uh, the, the other piece is helping people to get to living wage, career ladder employment. Um, and that becomes really critical in this overall solutions process. The slide that I'm showing here today is acknowledging that um, not everybody needs the same type of housing. And typically, um, if you are on the lower end of the economic spectrums, um, spectrum, you have more needs. Um, that's not a a global mandate. It's just, it, it's the joys and pains of, of dealing with poverty. Um, and so when you're looking at serviced enriched housing options, there are two financing buckets that you have to consider. One, uh, which most people just focus on is the brick and mortar, the cost of doing, a, a, you know, delivering a new unit of housing. And while that's expensive and it has lots of zeros behind it, that's the easy part of the equation. The tougher part of the equation is the ongoing operations and how do you pay for services to support residents that are living there. And, and that is an ongoing challenge and um, that, that I think both stakeholders in the public, private and philanthropic community need to continue to work together to try to solve. Um, and I think what we see as, I guess, cross-sector solutions are policies. Um, and we are active members with the Virginia Housing Alliance. And, and, and we love the work that Brian and his team do because one sector, whether it's philanthropy or public sector or the corporate community, one sector can't solve this. Um, it is only when we have alignment with our priorities um, and strategies that we will be able to make a dent in, in these uh, just blossoming issues across the country and here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So working on the policy front really helps to adjust where resources go and to level the playing field of opportunity access for more housing development and preservation. The second cross-sector solution is really around, um, if you're gonna play in this space, then you have to invest deeply. This is not surface stuff. And while you know a small grant is always appreciated, um, and I appreciate Jessica talking about flexibility and grant money as a nonprofit person for 30 years, um, we appreciate that greatly. But housing is expensive. And in our market in Central Virginia to deliver one unit of rental housing is roughly um, about $175,000. That's an affordable housing unit. In Northern Virginia, um, and I know Michelle is on the call, um, that's probably 450 to 500,000. And if you have friends that live in on the West Coast, it's over three quarters of a million dollars. That's for one unit of housing. It's crazy, but it is. And the cost of an affordable housing unit is the same as a market rate unit. The big difference is the capital stack that we use to pay for that brick and mortar. And ultimately in the nonprofit sector, using housing tax credits and philanthropy and other public sector programs, we try to get our debt down to around 20 or 25%. And that's how we can offer rents at a fraction of what market rate rents are going. So that, that's important. Um, but it, you need both grant monies and um, uh, impact investing dollars at scale. Um, a little bit doesn't go a long way. And so as you're thinking about your strategies to be involved in this, Alignment with others is important and knowing that um, it needs to be a, rick, a big rock dropped in the financing pond. And the last piece I would say is that um, it has taken, taken um, generations of 
discriminatory policies, practices, and attitudes that have created the imbalance that we have primarily along racial lines of uh, the lack of opportunity access and quality housing at an affordable price. And so it will take a long time to more fully and in a more robust, robust manner, really uh, correct wrongs from a long time ago. And so your timeline and, and your horizon for your involvement, it just, I would say if you're, you're not committed for this long term, then I would say uh, don't get involved because it's so, it's so many different players uh, that are here. Um, it's complicated, it's political, um, and, it, and, and there's a lot of racial bias that has to be identified and untangled and, and done away with and put back more equitable policies and, and attitudes so that all of our neighbors, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their race, have an opportunity to be their best selves and contribute to our commonwealth, our country, our world um, to be better. So um, housing is so fundamental for everything that we want. And I know that you have subgroups that are looking at education, that are looking at systems change, that are looking at, I can't remember all of the other ones, maybe healthcare, all of those are important. But if people don't know where they're gonna lay their head at night, it's almost impossible to address those other issues um, so that we are the best people that we possibly can be. And I'll get off my soapbox and, and, and stop now uh, talking and would be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Greta. Greta, will you, you mentioned the importance of uh, support services and sustaining those services for folks uh, I just wondered if you might share a little bit about what BHC was able to provide to your residents during the pandemic. Uh -oh. Well, uh, pre-pandemic, um, we had a robust set of services that fell into three buckets. Um, we have a lot of seniors on fixed income that live with us. So helping our seniors to age in place with dignity is one bucket. We have career navigation services to help our working adults who uh, many of them have minimum wage jobs to try to get to more living wage career ladder employment. And then we have educational and cultural enrichment services for the kids who live uh, on our campuses. Um, all of that stopped um, uh, when everything shut down and that was for health reasons that we closed down all of the community centers all of the in-person um, uh, programming that we had stopped with probably the exception of our food program, especially for seniors. Um, and we were able to work out a crazy system with Feed More um, because you know, for a lot of our seniors that are living on um, probably uh, less than uh, $1,500 a month uh, of income, gross income, um, to, to, there's more month than food sometimes. So we needed to, to get that going. And we did a lot of education because there was so much misinformation that was floating around just what, what are safety protocols, what, what, what's good factual information. Um, we hosted um, vaccination sites um, on, on several of our campuses to try to get as many people vaccinated. And then our resident services team switched from in-person to telephonic because a lot of our seniors in particular didn't have internet access. Um, and some of our families didn't have internet access. So that's why the private sector fundraising that we were able to provide, um, we were buying hotspots, we were doing laptops because at this point in our evolution as a society, um, internet access, um, is just as important as electricity and water in order to survive. And so um, I'm grateful that the, that the uh, governor and the General Assembly is going to be investing in broadband broadly across the, the Commonwealth. And maybe if the infrastructure bill passes, there will be more money to ensure that all households across the Commonwealth 
have internet access and then we need to leverage that for health reasons, educational reasons, and, um, and workforce development uh, opportunities. But um, we just opened up our community centers this month. And honestly, I think we're probably going to shut them down again by the end of the month, just because the numbers are going up and we try to, we're trying to use science to help guide well, science and our values to help guide um, going through these choppy waters where there is no roadmap um, and it's scary and exhausting, but um, we're trying to do the best that we can both for our um, employees and then for our residents. <laughs> We've got a couple of raised hands. Um, Rob, and please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to all three speakers. Really terrific. Um, I'm curious from a policy angle, all three of you have addressed policy and advocacy issues in one way or another and talking, you know, informing policymakers. So my question is um, what you hear from policymakers about their um, uh, sort of will and prioritization of housing issues, either in a local level or at the state level. Um, and, you know, Gladys, you did a, a, I'm sorry, Greta, you did a great job in talking about the need for alignment and sort of strategic priority setting. And I hear policymakers talk about the need for affordable housing, but not so much perhaps the alignment and the resources to follow. So I'm, I'm curious from all three of your perspectives, what you think about that. Yeah, uh, I'll just jump in first. You know, when there is alignment, amazing things can happen, but getting there is not easy. Um, and I, there is more awareness from a public sector or elected official level about the need for and benefit of affordable housing than I've ever seen in my 30 years in this business. But we still come down to NIMBY, not in my backyard. And uh, when, when you have to implement something, everyone's for affordable housing until it comes to their neighborhood. And we had a $48 million senior deal in the short pump, short pump section of Henrico County very exciting deal in partnership with a church. And we did our due diligence on the front end with a local board of supervisor who said he was with us. He, we knew that we needed affordable senior housing in the area. And when over 400 neighbors with average home values in the six to $700,000 range organized themselves to say that we were bringing public housing to short pump and that we were bringing crime to the area they, they feared for the safety of their children and that their house values were gonna plummet. The elected official um, uh, removed his support for the project and it died. So the I think there's knowledge, um, but we still have to work on political will. And that's where the philanthropic community, the corporate community standing with us in front of the elected officials to give them coverage, I think is really, really important. Last thing that I'll say, and I, I don't know if Brian agrees with me, we've been talking about for years the need for inclusionary zoning, which is mandating that every developer, whether they're private or nonprofit, has to do some portion of their development as affordable housing. And the home builders and others have fought us on that at the General Assembly, but I honestly think the crisis is so big that uh, depending on what happens in November with the elections, we ought to make a run for that in the General Assembly here in, um, in the Commonwealth to mandate uh, inclusionary zoning across the board, to just have more production of affordable housing throughout the state. Brian, did you wanna follow up on that question? Cause I, if not, I have a different question. Yeah, sure. Just real quickly. So I, I agree with everything Greta said, you know, I think at the at the state level, um, housing is a focus for, you know, a, a handful of, of legislators, they understand the, the role that housing plays. But there is, there is a disconnect. And I think we saw this very acutely during this special session, we went in with, with the support of the Department of Housing and Community Development, with, with requesting a 
a $500 million kind of one-time investment um, on for acquisition costs, right? Uh, uh, we assembled a group of our, our members and put this proposal together. And, um, and, and so when you look at the, the, the budget presentation, you know, the slide that was entitled housing was all about rental assistance. And, um, you know, rental assistance is not housing investment. And, um, kind of, but, it, and I get it, right? I mean, legislators are overwhelmed. I think it's probably one of the worst jobs I can imagine. Um, but, in, in the, and then the cost of it, right? So I'm, you know, I'm, I was asked time and time again, well, you know, if we put all this money on the streets, aren't, you know, property, property owners going to just jack up their prices and this, that, and the other thing. And are we putting good money after bad? And, you know, nobody asked that about, you know, is the cost of broadband cable going to increase now that we've put all this money on, on the table? So it's like this, it, it, you know, it, it really comes down to housing is a, is a commodity and, um, and, and we've got to really, I think, make the, make the moral argument that, you know, I mean, two billionaires just went to, went to outer space, right? Like we have the, we have the money to solve this issue. Um, we just don't have the, I think the political will, and then it gets hung up at, you know, I mean, Greta just, you know, talked about that deal in short pump. I mean, we, we can talk about deals all day that, that get shut down by, um, by local governments, county board supervisors. There was one just in Chesterfield um, and it, it was egregious. I mean, they were, you know, the, the, the folks that came out in, in, in opposition to the, to the development were, you know, we've already got too many Hispanics and poor people in this neighborhood and we don't need more affordable housing and we don't need the investment. We don't need more of those types of people. It's this, this constant othering um, that we just have to somehow, somehow get over. Can I, can I just add, add to that um, too? I mean, I, I'll echo too exactly what Greta and Brian said is we're definitely seeing a lot of not in my backyard kind of conversations going around here. I think um, at the same time, there has been much more interest in the last couple of years in creating affordable housing. And I think in, in large part, it's because um, our business community has been much more active at talking about um, housing is essential to talent recruitment and retention. So people are not typically moving to the New River Valley, you know, unless they've got a connection here already. And if we wanna develop um, our businesses, particularly, you know, keeping um, students that graduate from tech, keeping them here in the area, there's got to be housing that's affordable. And that affordability is, is not for what you might think of as, as sort of lower income folks. It's as much for teachers and police officers as it is for many of the, you know, faculty members just coming into Virginia Tech, that there's no way they can buy a house in Blacksburg. It's just not possible. So, you know, as we try to rethink who redefine or at least help people to understand what we mean by affordability. Um, I think that that has helped our elected officials to have to see it with a greater sense of urgency than they've seen before. Thanks, Jessica. That actually is a segue into the question that I have, which a lot of times when we think about and talk about affordable housing, we're often talking about affordable rental units. And as we all know, uh, uh, home ownership is the way that families in America build wealth, right? So I'd be interested to hear the, the bright spots that you guys are seeing uh, or what you might be excited about in the affordable home ownership space right now. Um, I just think that that has major equity implications um, and, and also, you know, quality of life and, um, and wealth building implications as well. So just wanted to know what you, what you guys are seeing out there. Well, I'll, I'll kind of start. So as I mentioned in my presentation, we, our region just went through a pretty comprehensive housing study um, and we're really fortunate here in the New River Valley that our localities work very well together and they tend to think regionally, um, which we know does not happen across the board, but certainly does in the NRV. So um, 
we're just uh, starting to look at developing um, a housing trust fund here in the NRV that can help support more affordable housing options um, and trying to take some, some more regional approaches that I think have been really interesting for folks to explore and try to learn from one another um, on building um, units that are more affordable, particularly for both young professionals as well as retirees, so an, an, an aging population that needs a certain type of housing. So um, there's been a lot more recognition of that in the region, and I think a willingness on the part of, you know, places like Blacksburg that are dealing with really high land cost and, and, um, and density issues, and then Floyd County, where it's about maintaining as much agricultural land as you can, and the fact that they're willing to work together to figure out what the right way to do is, is really encouraging down here. Um, I am optimistic um, around uh, a variety of conversations and actions that are starting to happen um, around racial equity. You really can't talk about housing without talking about race here in America. And uh, again, we're looking at uh, black home ownership rates being at a 50 year low right now. And so there is again, more alignment around um, both corporate philanthropic, governmental and, and uh, development community um, folks trying to work in partnership together on how we can create more inventory and, and a level uh, opportunity access for households of color to become homeowners. Um, we have new tools and I'd say, Jessica, just keep pushing forward from the housing trust. It took us 10 years locally um, and at the state level to put that together. So it's a process. Um, we have a community land trust now, which is another tool in the toolkit. Um, we have a great housing finance agency with Virginia Housing that's investing in innovation and research and development. So we've done a, a container home or two, just trying new construction methodologies. We were involved with the 3D printed house, um, one of several that's going on around the state. That is not affordable, but we're at the front end of innovation and over time, hopefully the cost and learnings will, will the learnings will grow, the cost will come down. Um, and then there are, uh, you know, I'm involved in a couple of other efforts around um, really looking at that wealth disparity between whites and, and households of color. And, and I think there's a growing willingness to bring a variety of resources together to try to uh, create more home ownership. Some of this is it's the cost of housing and just land um, zoning is a big piece on trying to allow greater density. Um, some of this is around credit readiness and trying to get households um, and really, you know, if you get an eviction, because that's what the topic of this gathering was, if you get an eviction, you're, you're um, credit is screwed the pooch um, for many years. And so trying to help people not get evicted because it has all sorts of other cascading impacts, but it, it dings your credit in a substantial way that will prevent you from getting becoming a homeowner for, for some time. And then we have to work with our lending institutions because ultimately they have a black box of credit analysis, I, I think that is more and more being done by artificial intelligence. But over the last, I don't know, many decades, the decline of mortgage applications for households of color is like triple that of households or mortgage applicants who are white. And so there are biases that are throughout the whole ecosystem of how homeownership works. One last thing, which I'm super excited about, and we're in the throngs of it right now at Better Housing Coalition, we used to do neighborhood revitalization. So we take a vacant house or a vacant lot and do home ownership and sort of like a missing or a smile with missing teeth or a rotten tooth. We go in and sort of make the, the block whole. We lost money on every house that we did. It was important. We did 250 of those, but we lost money and that's not a big successful business model. 
Um, we are now starting construction on urban subdivisions where scale matters in doing this to try to bring down the per unit house uh, cost of doing a, a home. And so we're doing 36 for sale houses in the East End in Church Hill. And we just got site control a few months ago um, for 122 unit subdivision in the north side community of Highland Park, which we're very excited about to do that in partnership with a variety of other, uh, I think three other nonprofits that are gonna be helping us to build. So th there are some positive steps, but a lot more work to be done. Um, and yeah, just to piggyback on, on what's already been said. So I think that, you know, there, there are a couple federal initiatives. Senator Warner is introducing legislation um, for a home ownership program um, that would <clears throat> that would leverage um, a, a second mortgage and be targeted to I think uh, uh, 120 percent of area median income households. When I mean, you look at those numbers, it, that is disproportionately um, non-white, and so. Um, but you know. And I, I was very clear with him about this is that if you Google or I, I did a Zillow, this is not scientific. I did a Zillow search for, for across the state. Um, and at that time, there were like 2,300 uh, homes available across Virginia at $200,000 or less. About half of those weren't actually homes, but they were just vacant. They were just vacant parcels. Um, so we don't have the inventory uh, is, is one thing. And like as Greta said, it's really difficult to build those kind of starter homes, the, that, that step, you know, that kind of step ladder um, for to get low income households into that into that pipeline. We do do down payment assistance. Um, you know, I know Housing Opportunities Made Equal administers it for the Richmond region. I know there's down payment assistance in, in Northern Virginia and elsewhere across the state. We can certainly ramp that up um, and make those, you know, tweak those programs. Um, the other thing, and I'm, I'm optimistic, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic, there is a, a bipartisan bill <clears throat> called the Neighborhoods Home Improvement Act. And basically it is setting up, it is a, a tax credit program. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the low income housing tax credit program, but it builds about 95% of all affordable housing in, in the country. It's um, really geared towards multifamily. This would be a new program that would be specifically for the construction of home ownership um, and whatever, whatever instant, you know, whatever form that takes. I think the other thing, and not to get like too theoretical, um, but if we kind of like go back and like unpack this, all of this, like homeownership is an economic development tool and driver, right? It, it is, it is, we know that for every home, for every like five homes sold so that that creates demand for one new home but like the the concept of the american dream and the single family detached house with the white picket fence and you know it that's not the american dream for the majority of people anymore and so housing is definitely in in real estate owning property is certainly a path to to wealth and um, it, it is definitely a path that has been denied since the founding of this country to, um, you know, to non-white people. Um, but there are, you know, there are limitations to that. Um, and there are, um, you know, not one size fits all, but I do fully agree. We need more starter homes. We need more home ownership opportunities. Um, and we need, but we need to 
we need to be able to build them and not, like Greta said, do it at a loss. Thanks, that's I, really I have a uh, question for Brian and Greta on a less theoretical uh, ground, but before I do that, I'd just like to tell you that uh, for over 40 years until just recently, I practiced land use law. And I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be speaking to a group of people that would like to see housing built, as opposed to being a part of a meeting like that Brian referred to where 400 people are screaming at me for trying to build residential housing. So uh, thank you for this forum. Um, and the question for Brian and for Greta uh, is somewhat practical from a funder's perspective, where in order to get to your 25% uh, debt ratio on that housing that you build, where is the most difficult, uh, where are the most difficult dollars to find from the philanthropic community so we have some idea of uh, how we can be helpful or most helpful in trying to get that, uh, that debt stack put in proper perspective so that you're able to build the housing that you would like to build. So I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. So um, let's do a little bit of math and let's say a, um, a, a one unit of housing cost $100. And our target um, uh, mortgage amount is no more than 25 cents. Um, and um, you know, there are three ways to finance real estate. Uh, grant money is the best. We love grant money, but trying to do multi-million dollar development with all grant money is not very practical. Um, debt is good, and we're in a great uh, debt uh, or interest rate environment right now. But still, that's the piece that you want to keep to 20 or 25 percent. And as Brian mentioned, the low income housing tax credits creates equity. And but it's not like private equity. Private equity is where you have investors and they're coming in and they're looking for a double digit return. And in, um, it used to be five to seven years. Now it's three to five years. Um, they, they support a developer. They come in, they do the development, and then they flip the property and everybody makes money and they walk away happy. That's a great model, but it doesn't help serve the long-term needs of lower income households. So for us, with the housing tax credit, um, our investors, which are mostly financial, <clears throat> excuse me, financial services, organizations, banks, insurance companies, they're not looking to ever get that money back. They aren't looking really for a return. What they're looking for is a reduction in their tax liability to Uncle Sam. And that's the benefit for them. And it helps them meet their um, CRA obligations that they're mandated to meet. So we get about 65%. If we can get an allocation of low-income housing tax credits, that equates to 65% of the capital stack. So now we have 65 and we have 25. And help me do the math. That is, it's too early in the morning still, um, but it's up there. And that last little bit of 10 or 15% is where we use public sector, um, community development block grant, home dollars, housing trust dollars, and philanthropic investment. And that's the piece that really makes the deal work. Um, and that's critical. Um, so coming in on the top piece of that capital stack so we can get our debt down as much as we can is important. And then I would say supporting with flexible grant dollars the ongoing um, uh, services needs. If we have pro forma the deal correctly, then the rent that comes in and, and the property performs as, as anticipated we will have enough money to cover the debt and the operating costs. What, we, what, what the current structure does not allow is to earn enough money on those rental properties to be able to pay for services so that our residents can be successful. Um, so that, that would be my answer there. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just follow up with, you know, the, um, <clears throat> the low-income housing tax credit 
program, I believe, you know, every year um, they get, they're only able to fund less than half of the, of the applications, right? Um, they're super competitive, they're scored, there's, you know, there's points um, that are awarded for all sorts of various things, energy efficiency, proximity to transit, um, um, community rooms, services, all, all of these things. Um, and then we have the housing trust fund. And so if you, um, and the housing trust fund is usually reserved as the very last bit of funding that goes into a deal to, to bring it all together. And so I was just at a, uh, uh, ribbon cutting um, up in, in Arlington, $240 million project. The trust fund provided $600,000 of, of um, funding to, to, to close that deal. Um, so we're under like just the, the whole system is under resourced, right? And so in the competition for the housing trust fund, I think is even more um more severe than for low-income housing tax credit. Um, we were able to, with our, with our partners um, at the Home Builders um, and some national, national partners, um, stand up a state opportunity housing tax credit program. Um, it's barely, it's barely funded, but we've got, <laughs> we've got our foot in the door. Um, and we're going to try and get that, get that fully funded for, you know, $150 million a year. But I mean, the, the numbers just are, are massive. Like when you start looking at a per door unit cost of $250,000, and we know that we have about $150,000 or 150,000 short unit shortage, I, I can't do the math in my head on how many zeros that are. There are a lot of zeros behind that. And so, um, and then also the, the, we're, you know, working really hard to figure out how to provide that services component and fund that because I know Greta fundraises a ton of money as do all of our other nonprofit partners um, to provide those services. And that's the critical component, right? Because we we know that we can just build housing and at the end of the day, we just to build housing. And that is transformative for a lot of people. But what's really transformative and what really works is to have those wraparound services to connect people to the resources that they and their family need, you know, on an individual basis to really transform people's trajectory. I one other thing, oops, sorry. Go Just ahead, Greta, let's cut it. <laughs> one, okay, what, one last thing. Um, if the infrastructure bill passes, big if, in Washington, there is a lot of housing related components in there, which would potentially um, double the amount of low income housing tax credits that are available to deploy across the Commonwealth well, across the country um, and including Virginia. Um, to be competitive for the tax credit program, we have to spend a quarter of a million dollars for every project that we submit. I mean, and so, so it's not for the faint of heart. And we've been fortunate over the last two years to get two projects. So that's a half a million dollars of our capital tied up. Um, and, and there have been years where we, Put in an application and we didn't get an award so that's a quarter of a million dollars invested in the process and then we didn't get it so it, it is uber competitive and um, hopefully there's a better and more streamlined process that we can work on but right now that's the only thing that we know um, I am sensitive to our time. It's amazing how quickly it goes when you are having amazing conversation. And I am just so grateful to our three speakers today, Brian, Jessica, and Greta. We know that you have a million other things on your plate. So thank you so much for spending the time and providing all of your expertise and uh, great information. It's been incredibly valuable. Um, typically, 
we would have had an opportunity to break out as a group and had some conversation about what this networking group is going to look like and what we might be looking at for next sessions. But I think it was way more important to spend our time having the good discussion that we had. So we will be following up, Patty and Katie will be getting a survey out to all of you and included in that survey will be questions about what you might like to see in upcoming sessions. There is obviously so much to unpack in this issue um, area. So please do let us know where you think we would be um, most, um, it would be most impactful for us to spend our time. Um, but I will just say thank you again. And Caroline, Katie, Patty, anybody wanna close us out? I, just thank I think you guys so much. Yeah, this was a great session. Um, and, and please do think of other topics or, or things that you would like to see, um, especially around innovative strategies and opportunities for partnership in the future. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Thanks. everybody.